Good everyone, my name is Rowan Horoff. I'm the business manager at Monroe Forensic Actuaries. And we are starting a very exciting series called Pod Shots. It's not a podcast, it's a shot, like a shot of espresso, concentrated coffee to get you going, to get your brain thinking. And we're thinking specifically about actuarial stuff. So today I have uh, my colleague who's uh, one of our senior actuaries, Vernon Boshoff, who will be joining me today as we just discuss uh, some topics. Specifically, the topic we're looking to discuss today is what we are seeing in defendant reports that have a material impact on the claim. So we're just going to talk a little bit about each of these things in some form of order. And Willem's going to give us his uh, expert opinion. So welcome, Willem. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Rowan. So Willem, why don't you explain to our audience what is the road accident fund cap and how does that impact the claim? Uh, the Road Accident Fund Amendment Act cap was introduced in 2008. Uh, the goal of the legislation was to limit the Road Accident Fund's liability. Uh, the way the cap works in short is that you look at the loss arising in each future year of your calculation and then after discounting and mortality, the maximum loss you can allow for that year is capped yes. at the cap limit. Uh, now, this is generally not problematic in actuarial calculations, but we have had an instance uh, quite recently uh, where the defendant calculated uh, the loss actuarially. And in that instance, the accident, I think, happened in 2005. Mm. So the cap shouldn't have applied yes. naturally, but they did apply the cap. Mm. And it had an enormous impact. Uh, the loss uncapped was in the order of 12 million. And if memory serves me correctly, uh, the loss that the RAF calculated was in the order of 5 million rand. Um, this is an obvious thing and, a, and a, has a big impact, um, but it is something you know, to note that the cap calcul has to be calculated correctly. Yeah, so for our, our clients, it really is important to match the date of accident with whether it's before or after 2008 to, to really determine if it's been that little error has Yeah, and an to make sure that the actuary... Uh, took the cap into account or didn't take it into account as appropriate. Yeah, exactly. And I think sometimes you were referring back to the errors you were talking about earlier, those little things where it's either an input error um, or it's a misinterpretation of something that's relatively simple can have a massive impact on the claim. And so it's important that as an actuary, you are scrutinizing, even at the most detailed level, those little things that we, I suppose, just take for granted. Yes, absolutely. Okay, fantastic. And then other types of reports that we do that are not necessarily within the road accident fund uh, setting, but we've, we've seen um, with regards to medical costs, there's sometimes a little bit of controversy maybe or different application around the inflation assumptions that are applied to medical costs. Don't you want to explain a little bit what... I suppose, is inflation and how the, call it the normal inflation CPI impacts medical costs and then again how we apply a different type of inflation to compensate for the lack that's within uh, normal inflation. Uh, so when the, the capital value of costs are calculated, some actuaries would simply use CPI or price inflation uh, with the assumption that in the very long run, nothing can indefinitely outstrip CPI inflation. We, we view it differently. We've got a, a very long-term data set specifically around uh, medical inflation since the 1960s. And a long-term analysis of medical costs shows that it consistently outstripped price inflation over this period. There's some time periods, short periods, where it might be under or above uh, price inflation. But generally, there's been um, a consistent um, addition to medical inflation. If we calculate medical costs by projecting it to increase only at price inflation, we arrive at a lower figure capitalized, uh, which I think really runs the risk of undercompensating the claimant. So we've gone and based on our analysis, have a long-term medical price inflation assumption that we apply to our medical costs when you calculate the value. And we believe it's well justified. And when you say if you apply the wrong inflation or CPI and the, the claimant is undercompensated, that means they won't actually have enough money to purchase the medical service or the medical device when they need it. Absolutely. So if, for instance, uh, one would need surgery in 10 years' time, 
And uh, the medical expert says, well, currently that surgery would cost 200,000 Rand. If in 10 years time, we've only allowed for price inflation and for argument's sake, say then it's uh, 300,000 Rand at price inflation, but at medical inflation, the surgery would actually cost you 350,000 Rand. The claimant would be 50,000 Rand out of pocket. And that's based on a wrong assumption. Yeah, and it shows how important inflation is. So tell us briefly, how do we use industrial psychology reports? And then why is it that actuaries can differ even if they have the same industrial psychologist report in front of them? In most cases, the industrial psychologist report informs the actuarial calculation. So all the information regarding earnings, uh, retirement age, etc., we get from the IP report. If two actuaries use the same IP report and calculate a, a different figure, it means there's either inherent difference in their assumptions, but if that's not the case, it is about how they interpret this IP report. Now, ideally, an IP report should not be interpreted. If the IPs do their work really well, they'll give us a report that requires no interpretation and we can simply calculate what they say. But unfortunately, that's not always the case. So. We often have to make informed assumptions or interpretation based on a likely outcome. Uh, to give you an example, if an IP postulates a future career progression for a person, say in the uninjured scenario, and they say they would have earned at a certain Patterson level, but they don't state whether or not it's basic earnings guaranteed package or to total package earnings, you as an actuary either have to go back to the industrial psychologist, which is not always possible, or you have to make an informed assumption what is the most likely case. In our case, if somebody is postulated to have corporate employment, we believe it's more likely that you would earn a total package figure, except if it's very early in your career. But once somebody is established in a role, they will normally get the same corporate benefits as all their colleagues. Another example is, for instance, where somebody has a provident fund and they contribute as as an employee to the uh, Provident Fund, but there's no information on the pay slip as to whether the employer contributes to the Provident Fund. In those instances, we make an assumption that the employer does contribute to the Provident Fund because that's more often than not the case. It might not be factually true, but barring factual information, we go with the assumption of what we deem to be most likely. And all these things add up. So ultimately, that might have a substantial impact on the claim amount calculated. So finally, Willem, can you give us an example of a, a matter that you've dealt with where in the report we see the impact of different assumptions or methodologies that are applied? Yes, Rowan, I've recently done a report. Uh, we were approached by a couple who were claiming directly from the road accident fund and were furnished um, with a an actuarial report produced by the fund's actuaries um, in respect of their claim. And the number they calculated was a lot lower than what they expected. So they wanted to get another actuary's opinion. Yeah, I understand, yeah. In this report, and, and basically this couple was an older couple. Uh, they had a daughter. The daughter unfortunately passed away in an accident and she was financially uh, taking care of her parents. Um, the daughter was 26 years old at the time. Uh, she had an honors degree. She was busy, busy studying towards her master's. She was employed, and the calculation that the fund did in this instance is, firstly, they used life table four, oh. which we believed were inappropriate for a number of reasons. Yes. Uh, then they also included a notional child, even though she wasn't in a relationship, wasn't married, and according to her parents, had no interest in having children. Uh, they also did not allow for any career progression. So for somebody at that age with that top qualification studying further, you'd expect them, uh, their earnings to increase by substantially more than mere earnings inflation. Uh, we then did a calculation for this couple based on our internal assumptions and methodologies. And without being too elaborate or too favorable towards them, the claim that we calculated ended up being more than double wow. the one calculated uh, by the fund. Fantastic. Well, Willem, thanks very much for your time today. And for your expert uh, knowledge, it's clear that the 13 years have, have served us well in terms of what you understand. And thank you for listening to our pod shot series. I hope that concentrated shot of information really serves you in your practice. 
If you have any comments, please put them below. You're always welcome to email us at actuary at monroefa.com. We have a rich reservoir of resources on our website where you can get access to training, previous webinars, templates. We also have a link to Munro TV, which is our YouTube channel where this podshot will be appearing. And it in itself has videos from over a long period of time that deal with a number of different actuarial aspects. And then also we have a link to our connect portal, which is our client service portal. And if you're a client of ours, you have exclusive access to your reports, your financial documents, and so much more on that portal. Thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you at our next podshot.